Hi everyone. Hope you are all taking care and staying safe during these COVID times. Over the next about 10 minutes, what we are going to do is look at how to approach a spine radiograph. I think the most important thing by looking at a radiograph is to know the normal appearance. Only when you know how the normal structures look on a radiograph will you be able to identify abnormal. And it's important to have a systematic approach. You need to look at structures in a systematic way rather than just random when you tend to miss findings. And a good system to follow for any musculoskeletal radiograph is to look at A, B, C, D, S. A, B, C, Ds. A is the alignment. B is the bones. C is cartilage, that is joint space and in spine it is the intervertebral disc space. D is the density of the bones. S is soft tissue, look for any soft tissue calcification, any soft tissue opacities. And in the lumbar spine, the S also stands for sacroiliac joints. Do not forget to look at the sacroiliac joints. Let's begin with cervical spine lateral radiograph. The very first question we need to ask ourselves, is the radiograph adequate? Is there any jewellery, earring, hooks or something which are obscuring the spine? Is the penetration of the x-ray adequate? How do we know that? If we can see the upper half of the T1, the first thoracic vertebra and we can see the occiput as well as the palate, then the x-ray penetration is adequate. Sometimes we come across radiographs where only about 5 or 6 cervical vertebrae are seen. Then it's very important that we mention in our report that only the upper 5 cervical vertebrae are visualized because there may be pathology in the vertebrae which are hidden. After looking at the radiograph and deciding that it is adequate, we proceed further. And the first thing we start with is A, the alignment. It's important to look at three lines in the lateral radiograph of cervical spine. First is the anterior vertebral line drawn along the anterior margins of the vertebral bodies. Next is the posterior vertebral line drawn along the posterior margins of the vertebral bodies. And then you have the spinolaminar line. So this is the spinous process and these will be the lamina. So at their junction, all these three lines should be smooth. There should be no sudden disruptions and they should be parallel to each other which suggests that there is normal alignment. Then we need to look at the bones. We need to look at the size and height of the vertebral bodies. Is there any compression deformity or not? We need to look at the intervertebral disc spaces if they are uniform. In the cervical spine especially, we need to look at this area. So this area here is the posterior quadrilateral architecture because on the lateral radiograph, you have overlap of the pedicle, laminae, the articular process all on together. And when you know this, the inferior articular process of the superior vertebral body is posterior the upper vertebral body. So C5 inferior articular process is posterior while C6 superior articular process is anterior. This is the normal orientation of the facet joint. So all these look like tiles in a roof. There should be no disruption of this normal anatomy. Then we need to look at the dimension of the cervical spinal canal. Is there any significant narrowing? So if you measure the AP dimension of the vertebral body and AP dimension of the canal. So again, it's from posterior margin of the vertebral body to this spinolaminar line that we spoke of. So they should kind of be equal. It should not be smaller. That would suggest canal narrowing. Measurement wise, it should be more than 12 millimeter. This diameter here of the cervical spinal canal. Then we should start looking at the soft tissue. We looked at the A, B, C, D. When we look at soft tissue, most important to look at the retropharyngeal or the retrotracheal space. And this soft tissue 
we should be looking at the level of C2 or C3. Then we should be looking at the level of C7 also. And one way to remember it easily is 7 at 2 and 2 at 7. So it should not be more than 7 millimeter at C2 at this level and it should not be more than 2 centimeter at the level of C7. For example, here you can very clearly say the thickening of the retrotracheal soft tissue. This could be due to prevertebral hematoma, prevertebral abscess, whatever the pathology, but this is surely abnormal. Next, we need to look at the craniovertebral junction. And if we look at this space, this is the anterior arch of atlas. This is the posterior arch of atlas. This is the dens. So this is the anterior atlantodental interval. In children, up to 5 mm is acceptable. But in adults, it should not be more than 2.5 to 3 mm. If this is widened, that would suggest an atlantoaxial subluxation. And for example, here in this patient, you can see this distance is widened. And this could be due to a number of pathologies like rheumatoid arthritis, pseudonegative spondyloarthropathies, it could be congenital like Downs, Mocchio, spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia, infection, retropharyngeal abscess or infection at craniovertebral junction or due to trauma. The limitations of a lateral radiograph of cervical spine is that fractures of the craniovertebral junction can be missed and even arch of atlas, so the craniovertebral junction is not very well evaluated on a lateral cervical spine radiograph. Next, let's look at the AP radiograph of the cervical spine. We need to look at the symmetry and size of the vertebral body. So these vertebrae, if you look at, they look like little U-shaped structures. So all of them should have equal height. And remember in cervical spine, you have this uncinate process, this bony projection here. So here you can have uncinate process hypertrophy which could cause foraminal narrowing and nerve impingement and you can have degenerative changes at this level. Also look for the pedicles, look for the spinous process and the transverse process. So on the AP radiograph, if you look at the spinous processes, they are all aligned straight in one line. If you see any disruption and do not see the spinous process, that would suggest it could be due to facetal dislocation, it could be due to, uh, you should also look for the spinous process, there may be spina bifida or there could be fracture of the spinous process. So here you can see this, this fracture of the spinous process out here. So AP radiograph, look at the pedicles, look there is no disruption at those levels, check for the vertebral end plates, they are intact. Make sure you are looking at the tracheal shadow. If the tracheal shadow is displaced or compressed, it could be due to a thyroid mass lesion, it could be due to any neck mass lesion, prevertebral lesion which is compressing the trachea. On the cervical spine radiograph, look for the cervical rib. C7 transverse process should be shorter than the transverse process of first thoracic vertebra. If they are long, it is long transverse process and if you see a osseous cervical rib, you need to mention that. Because lateral and AP radiograph of cervical spine are not enough, we may need to do additional views. Now these views are difficult to do in patients with trauma. In fact, you do not want to uh, unnecessarily move these patients much which could probably exacerbate their injury. And then CT would be a better idea to evaluate that. But if you do open mouth view, through the open mouth, you can see the craniovertebral junction. It's important to look at the lateral mass of the atlas, the dents here, the C2. This is the lateral atlantoaxial joint, this space. So the lateral margin of C1 and C2 should be this. The lateral margin of C1 should not extend beyond the lateral margin of the C2. If it is, then you would suspect a fracture of the atlas. We need to look at this space here between the lateral mass and the dens. It should be equal both sides. We need to look at the dens itself. So look at the dens for fracture, non-union, 
look at the arch of atlas for any fracture note the distance between the dense and the lateral mass look at the atlanto occipital and atlanto axial joints again limitations could be based on how the patient has opened the mouth the cranio vertebral junction could be overlapped by the occipital condyle or by the teeth and you may not be able to visualize the structures well next coming to the cervical oblique radiographs because the neural foramen of the cervical spine are not end on in the lateral radiograph they are oriented obliquely so you cannot see them on a lateral radiograph you may want to take a oblique radiograph to evaluate the neural foramen so look at the neural foramen all should be of the same size with smooth osseous margins this will also show you this will open out the pedicles and the lamina and you can see them better on a right anterior oblique radiograph you will see the right foramina on the right posterior oblique you will see the left neural foramina so here is example there is significant widening of the neural foramen and smooth scalloping of the margins there is no erosion and this was in a patient with a nerve sheet tumor or neurofibroma here if you notice you can see this osseous spur here so oncovertebral hypertrophy and this facet arthrosis osteophyte together these are causing narrowing of this neural foramen and likely would cause nerve root uh, symptoms we may also do flexion and extension radiographs for cervical spine to assess for ligamentous laxity again in a patient with acute trauma you do not want to be doing this you don't want to exaggerate the injury which is there but in non acute cases you may want to do this again you look at the lines and these lines should be maintained the three lines we spoke about and a fourth line can be the line along the tips of the spinous process all of them should be smooth no disruptions should be parallel to each other the prevertebral soft tissue could increase slightly in these flexion and extension views so here is an example the neutral radiograph atlanto axial joint is looks normal on flexion you can see the space increasing on extension again it is normal so if we had done only neutral this being a dynamic process we would be missing this anterior atlanto axial dislocation as we can see in this case so flexion extension radiographs play an important role the last radiograph that may also additional radiograph which may be taken could be the swimmer's view which is a trans axillary lateral view with the arm abducted and again this is not to be done when somebody has got acute injury so this was about the approach to a cervical spine radiograph we will talk later about thoracic and lumbar spine radiographs and pathologies in the subsequent sessions thank you stay safe and take care